All right, I see people entering the Zoom room. Hello, everyone. My name is Morgan, and I'm an event manager at Politics and Prose, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. Soon, I will drop a link in the chat for where you can order a copy of The Dangers of an Ordinary Night straight from PNP's website. We also have book plates signed by the author available for this title. Also, our winter member sale starts tomorrow and runs through the weekend where PNP members can get 20% off majority of the store. So if you order a copy of this book tomorrow as a member, you get 20% off. Mm. You can ask our speakers a question by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get as many of those as, as we can towards the end of the program. But we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address your question. Also, there are auto captions for this event by hitting the live caption button at the bottom of your screen. Let's introduce tonight's guest. Lynn Reeves is an internationally recognized family counselor, public speaker, teacher, and writer of fiction and nonfiction. Her work has appeared in Parents, Psychology Today, Solstice Literary Magazine, Craft Literary Fiction, Fiction Writers Review, Brain, Child, and more. Writing as Lynn Griffin, she is the author of the family-focused novels and writes novels of domestic suspense as Lynn Reeves. Reeves will be in conversation with Angie Kim, the debut author of the international bestseller and Edgar Winner, Miracle Creek, named a best book of the year by Time, The Washington Post, Kirkus, and The Today Show, among others. Her, no her novel also won the ITW Thriller Award, the Strand Critics Award, and the Pinkley Prize. A Korean immigrant, former editor of the Harvard Law Review, and one of Variety Magazine's inaugural 10 Storytellers to Watch, Kim has written for Vogue, The New York Times, Book Review, The Washington Post, Glamour, and numerous literary journals. Let's give our, virtual, our guests a virtual round of applause. Yay! Thank you so much for that introduction, Morgan, and thank you so much, Lynn, for inviting me to be here and talk about your wonderful book with you. I'm so excited for this. Um, and yes, and for everybody um, in the audience, um, we will definitely have time for questions at the end, but if you would like to, please go ahead and put stuff into the Q&A and I'll sort of be monitoring and seeing if there's any intersection between some of the stuff that I wanted to get to ask Lynn and some of those questions. So I think that'll be so great. Um, and um, Lynn, I just wanted to, before we get started, I'm gonna ask you to say a little bit about your novel and introduce, introduce us to, um, you know, to your characters and to your story in your own words. But before we do that, I know that you already got an introduction, but I just wanted to brag a little bit about what amazing reviews that your book has been getting. So Kirkus, for example, said Reeves uncommonly assured novel is by turn sensitive and scarifying. And that I remember when I first read that, I was just like, I love that um, I love the sensitive and scarifying. I think that's just like a word that they made up, but I love it. <laughs> so I think it's great. And then um, I loved the nerd dailies write up of um, your novel. And um, and so I just wanted to um, read from that because I think it's just such a good sum up. Reeves draws on three decades of expertise as an internationally recognized marriage and family counselor, as well as her lifelong passion for theater for her riveting new novel of suspense. This twisty and affecting thriller, which combines a meticulously constructed crime story with a devastating domestic drama about the blind spots in our most precious relationships will be ir irresistible to book clubs. I totally agree, by the way, this is just Angie just interjecting. Uh, readers will relate to these seemingly ordinary characters who harbor explosive secrets. They'll be called to examine the deepest mystery of family life, why we often hide our private struggles from the people we love most. Um, I think that's a pretty good introduction, but still, um, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about the book for those of the people in the audience who haven't had a chance to read it. 
Thank you. Well, those are such kind words. And when those reviews come in, it's just, it's always, you're always literally on the edge of your seat, hoping that readers will really get what you tried to accomplish. So that feels wonderful to hear. Uh, the story is uh, uh, categorized as domestic suspense, but it really is an exploration of family life. And that is what I do really in all of my work. Uh, this particular story starts off when two young women leave a performing arts high school in Boston and they leave an audition and before you know it, they've gone missing. And when the girls are found, three people step in to try to figure out what really happened to them. The first is the mother of a girl who is found alive and all of her uh, trying to get her daughter back emotionally. She feels that her daughter has been returned to her but that her daughter really is changed. And the second character that steps in is a therapist who tries to help that child, that teenager, reacclimate to her family. And then there's also the detective with secrets of his own who is trying to figure out what happened to this family. And there it is. It's an exploration of family life and what we, what the secrets we keep from other, each other, why we do that, and what we are each hiding in the relationships that we care the most about. That's good. That's a great summary. Um, okay, so tell me about what your inspiration was for it. And I, we're definitely going to talk about, you know, theater and your role as a counselor and all of that sort of stuff. But just in general, like, what was the spark? What, how did you come to write it? And what, what came first in the story for you? Well, you know, for years, I knew I was going to write a novel about the theater. I, it was always in the back of my head that I love it so much. It was what I did when I was in high school and college and a little bit beyond that. And I loved theater so much, I knew it would land in one of my pieces of work at some point. So it's always been percolating. Uh, but what came to me first actually was the issue. As a family counselor, I hear about how addiction impacts families every day and in how it affects long-term marriage, how it affects the way we parent, the impact of addiction on our children. Uh, and so I always knew that that was going to be a story. But then when I started thinking about the hallmarks of addiction, which is that we do keep so much of that private struggle, either the person who's struggling with the addiction engages mm -hmm. in deception to keep the addiction alive, and the people in a family who don't feel like they can disclose to anyone outside the family what they're experiencing. This, as soon as I started getting into that real sense of what happens with the cycle of addiction, I knew that the theater piece connected brilliantly because it is about the masks we wear and it is mm. about the roles that we play. And each person in a family plays a role, you know, sometimes unwillingly. And in the characters in this case, unwillingly play roles. Well, I love that because um, I, I think I told you when we first talked, you know, talked, quote unquote, um, emailed, um, about your book, um, I told you that how, much, how meaningful it was to me because I went to a performing arts school. Um, I majored in theater. I actually majored in theater and piano. And there's a character in your novel who also plays the piano. And so between all of those things, uh, I really was so intrigued to read it. And then when I got into it, I, you know, I, I, I of course knew that the um, the Boston School of Performing Arts was, you know, at sort of the, at the center of it as um, as far as the setting, but it was more than the setting. It was baked into the structure of the novel. I love that um, your novel has not three parts, but three acts, you know, and I love that the title of um, each chapter is actually from a play. And, you know, it's the title of a play and the, and the variety of the titles. It's everything from like the Crucible to Miss Saigon and Rent, you know, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. So there we have Shakespeare, we have Ibsen, we have, you know, Doll's House, we have The Seagull um, with Chekhov. I mean, so tell me, and, and also even like the first line, the harvest moon is a spotlight leading, you know, that, that image that you, so you do this throughout. So it's not just the setting. Um, it's not peripheral to the novel. It, I feel like it's really baked in. Um, so yeah. So, so tell me more about 
Um, did you go to a school like this? And why was it important that some of the first things that we learn about these characters, these girls who go missing, and then one of them is found alive and one is found dead. Why is that so important that they came off, you know, this audition and the role that that plays in? So the whole theater piece, I, again, when I knew that I was going to include it, it didn't, it, it wasn't as integral as it became. So what happened in the drafting was that I realized that, that I could actually use the theater as the stage. In other words, it could be the structure upon which the story sits. And so then I did a ton of play research and I read play after play after play. And they all started working their way in there. And I kind of liken it to the hidden pictures that you used to play, you know, mm -hmm. Highlight Magazine when you were a kid mm -hmm. and all the little Easter eggs that are planted throughout. Right. So, so I did do it that way intentionally. And I did use the theater as that backdrop for exploring what's happening to us socially now, particularly teenagers, which is the idea that we're curating a persona, whether mm -hmm. we're on social media or whether we're in our friendships, we curate an image and then we play the image out even if that's not actually what's going on on the inside of ourselves and our families. Yeah. And so again, the theater just became, it really came alive structurally and metaphorically. Yeah, and also um, narratively too, because I felt like, you know, the characters, you know, one of the things that we're thinking, especially because you keep on reminding us that this is, you know, there is a role to be played with respect to fiction and storytelling and those narrative elements. So I found myself as a reader sort of constantly being reminded in a good way, like in a thoughtful way to sort of think, okay, what are the characters telling us? And what of that is you know, improvisational, what if that is being created versus what is the truth and what are the roles of sort of the honesty, truth um, versus lying versus performing, you know, all of these are all subtle distinctions and it's a spectrum. And so I felt like, you know, you as the author were sort of playing with those constructs as well, which I really thought was very thought provoking. Oh, thank you. I, I really took a lot of time to try to think through that whole complexity, which is what is the story that we tell ourselves? Because mm -hmm. oftentimes as human beings, we create our own narrative and then we're driven from that narrative, whether it's true or not. And in a lot of my novels, I work from more than one point of view, because again, as a family counselor, relationships are everything to me. Right. And I, I would never feel like I could do it in one point of view. I would have to do it in more than one to be mm -hmm. able to show that not only are we keeping secrets from ourselves, but we're keeping secrets from the people that we love the most. And that doesn't make sense sometimes. Why aren't those the people we trust the most as opposed to in some ways fear the most. Right. Um, but the keeping with this, you know, this question of secrets, that's something, one of the things that I'm always fascinated by and you know, sort of the role of shame and guilt that and lead us to keep secrets, but also a feeling sometimes that keeping secrets might actually be the most helpful for people that we love. And, you know, so the one of the characters that I'm thinking of right now, I'm sure you know who, um, you know, is keeping, a, you know, a, a secret that and we can be sort of um, absolutist moralistically about it, you know, and sort of say, well, no, you need to always tell the truth. And, you know, sometimes people can be like that. But at the same time, I think that this did a really interesting job of making us think is that always true? Is there, are there actually times when that actually might be the most kind thing that you can do for people that we love or the people, you know, um, who are in the position to be hurt if the truth comes out? Like, especially, I mean, certainly as a storyteller, but, but as a 
counselor, I was fascinated that it that it felt like that is what you were sort of saying through the storytelling, through some of the characters and the situations that you put them in. Is that sort of how you feel? Do you feel like that's the kind of thing that you want to be sort of telling the readers or, um, or is that something that you just want us to sort of like think about on our own and come to our own conclusions? Well, it's, it's really terrific that you picked that up because that was something that I really felt like was an important thread, which is that we don't want to say that everything's absolute. So, yeah. you know, never keep a secret, always tell the truth um, is, is a rather didactic way of looking at something or prescriptive, exactly. right? right? But the character that you're referring to is the detective. And right. so here's a person whose job is to uncover, uncover the truth. And yet he and his sister are keeping a secret in their family Right. And, they, and they struggle with keeping that secret because they know that telling it would hurt a lot of people. And they've made the decision, though they struggle, with that not telling it is the right choice to make. And so he's looking for redemption through this case that he's trying to solve because he doesn't feel like he has redemption from the secret he is keeping. Um, he was a character that I really enjoyed writing. Oh yeah, I could totally. I really, yeah, I, I, I think he may have been one of my favorites, and um, you know, and also there was the piano connection too with yeah, him, yeah, and yeah. you know, he goes to these bars and you know they're empty and he's playing. I could totally, totally relate to that in so many ways, and well, so I wanna, really I wanna really give a with him. I want to give a shout out to my son because he is a jazz pianist. And so, <laughs> and so not only did he inspire the character, but he was my technical advisor oh, um, great. <laughs> to make sure that I got it right because I do not play piano. Yeah. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. I, it's so funny because my um, two, well, all three of my, uh, my kids play piano. Uh, but my middle one actually composed a piece for my own audiobook, oh and so God. that's that's something that I highly recommend to you as something that you might you know want to sort of like say to your son because jazz piano would be great as a you know an accompaniment for um, audiobook. It's lovely, okay. wonderful. Uh oh, Lynn, you froze. Oh no, Lynn. Okay, well, maybe I'll ask a question in the hope that you can hear me, even though you seem, you appear to be frozen to me. Is it just me or does she? Most trusted reader and uh -oh. it's just wonderful that, you know, as can, uh-oh. Lynn, I think, I, I don't think it was just me. I think you disappeared for a little bit. You froze. I think I may have. I think okay. I may have. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you repeat everything you just said sure. <laughs> in the sure. last 30 seconds? Sorry. Sure. I just was saying it's wonderful that your children are involved because mine are as well. My daughter is my first trusted reader. And um, and I really, I, I, I appreciate their opinions so much. Uh -huh. So it's just wonderful to be able to have that experience. Yeah, no, I love that. Okay, so um, I wondered if, um, you know, I referred to the first line the, about the harvest moon, and I feel like it's just your story is so beautifully written. I was hoping that you might be able to read just like a paragraph or two for us, the, the opening, just to get the people in the audience who haven't started reading it yet and whet their appetite a little bit. Sure, I'd be delighted. That sounds okay. great. So again, each of the chapters are the title of a play. So the title of this chapter is The Swing of the Sea. The harvest moon is a spotlight leading June Danforth deeper into the woods. The girl is lost on the stark neck of land that occupies the coastline halfway between Boston and Cape Cod with no clear memory of how she got there. June remembers the audition, the casting director applauding her improvisation, and then leaving the high school with a friend. But the rest of the night is a blur, and the harder June tries to pin down specifics, like where Tally is now, the tighter her muscles get, the clammier her skin feels. Her train of thought is a twisted wreck. The only thing she's certain of is that something terrible is happening to them. 
She needs to keep moving to find Hallie. June's ballet flats are at odds with the terrain. The rocks are bent on tripping her and the thorny branches grab at her hem, her collar, her sleeves. Tired of defending her clothes, June considers taking them off. She could leave her slippers on a rock, hang her coat from a tree, but the offshore wind is a killjoy. It sings a warning. He will see them. He will find you. Yay. I loved that. Um, I feel like having just a little bit of the voice is just something that sort of anchors our conversation and something that I just enjoy so much. Um, so one thing that I wanted to ask you is your background as a family counselor. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me because there is a great counselor um, who's a character in the novel, uh, of course, but, um, and there are a lot of those themes that I know that you have um, thought about that are really important to you about addiction in particular, and also grief um, and dealing with those and trauma. And I just wonder, did you set out to write a story uh, a particular story that takes advantage of that background? Or do you feel like it's something that you're so drawn to and that's such a part of you that no matter what story you wrote, you would just find that element in what, you know, because that's obviously a universal element that's going to be in any conflict oriented story. Right. Well, I think it's a little bit of both of those things. So mm -hmm. I think it's very hard for me to take my counseling self out of anything I write, I think it always finds its way in. But it's always my hope that it finds its way in not as fiction in disguise, but as an exploration or an observation of what happens in family life. And I've always been drawn to the, the quote by James Joyce that in the particular contains the universe. Yes. The idea that one story can teach us so much, one experience can provide us with empathy for thousands of people, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what fiction does so beautifully. And I know you did that brilliantly in Miracle Creek. You take the idea of a social issue and you allow it to feed the senses and allow the reader to engage and have empathy, even if that's not exactly how it plays out in their lives. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was trying to do. And at the same time, I really wanted to deliver story to the reader. Yeah. I want them to have the page turning, twist and turns yeah. along the way. Uh, so it really is both. How about the opposite, the going the other way? Do, do you feel like your experiences as a novelist and a storyteller um, and even in the business of, you know, publishing a story and things like that, do you feel like that that helps to sort of develop or I don't know if develop is the right word, but you know, change or affect in some way your career as and and the way that you, you know, perform uh, perform, but that you serve people as a as a counselor. Yeah, it's really one of one hand and the other, right? It's hand in glove because people talk in story. So all of the clients that I see uh, there when they tell their story, it's riveting. They add just the right details. They have a natural sense of a narrative arc. They know exactly how to get me to pay attention. Hmm, that's interesting, <laughs> okay. And so really, even in the counseling setting, uh, people speak in story. And, and so I don't really see any place in my life that doesn't feel like uh, that's what I'm engaging with. When right. I tell a client to tell me more or how did this impact your family, um, those details are front and center and as with a good narrative. Right. Do you think any of your clients who know that you're, you know, you're a storyteller sort of feel like, do they ever ask you like, oh, do you want to, you know, do you want to actually write about this? Or are you going to write about this? Do, do, do Does that ever come up? I'm just curious. Yeah, it does come up that I, I always assure them that I don't use any clients. In oh, my of course. Life. Right. Uh, and that really what a, a fiction writer does is create whole cloth characters that come from a variety of places, that they are a, 
They are little bits of me. They are little bits of people I know. They're observation details that I get, gather from my interactions, but they're never a, an actual client. Uh, but I do reassure them that that's the case. Um, but I'm sure you get this, which is people say, oh, you should write my story. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Yeah, no, totally. That's one of the reasons why I, I didn't think that they were going to be worried that because, you know, they know that you're professional. But it, I, I figured that they would do the opposite, that they would be like, so I have the best story for you and you can feel free to use this in any way you want. And you're sitting there thinking, yeah, thank you. That's that's good. I'll take that <laughs> under advisement. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't work that way. Right. These characters right. really start to speak to you. And they come from a very, um, you know, it sounds very artistic to say, but they do come from a very inspirational place. Oh, definitely. They are com completely and uniquely uh, uh, attached to a particular story. Definitely. Um, so in terms of, because we've talked about the, we just talked about the titles of the chapters. So why the dangers of an ordinary night? as the title where I mean and one of you know very early on one of the characters actually uses that phrase um so of course you know our interest is sparked but what why that title titles always have interested me yes I love titles uh and I will have to say that this is the very first time that the title that I chose is the title that remained ah so that feels good uh, yeah I'll bet yeah I'll bet <laughs> Definitely. My um, own title changed after, like after the arcs were published. Yeah. So that was a challenge. So I, I applaud you on that for sure. Yes. yes. Um, but I think any of our listeners and viewers here are going to be able to relate to the idea that if you've ever experienced any trauma in your life, then you understand that you can be living your life and kind of going with the flow and marching along as if everything is good. And that the people that you love are are all right and they're doing okay. Yeah. And then something can happen. And what you don't realize is that anything can change in a snap and it may mm. be completely out of your control. And yet, when you look back, all of the evidence that something was unraveling was there all the time. Mm. And so that's where we get the phrase where the character says, you know, little did I know that the dangers were hiding in the ordinary night. And that's yeah. really, that's really, it's, it's in retrospect that we understand, but it isn't in the, it isn't before. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such a great um, theme to explore because it's just, it, it, because there's so many aspects that that concept applies to, you know, sort of something seeming so calm on the surface or so ordinary or so typical and then when you peel back the layers, then you sort of see that it, things weren't exactly the way they were. And you start sort of, you know, blaming yourself for not having seen these things that maybe you should have seen is what you tell yourself, of course. Right. Right? right. And I do think readers will grapple with that, whether some of these characters should have seen certain things. Oh, yes. Or, or, or whether or not we're going to be compassionate and say, well, maybe we wouldn't have seen it either. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I believe readers will struggle with it because they'll they'll wonder whether or not some characters really should, well, how did they miss that? Yeah. Whereas in other cases, you're saying, well, of course you missed that. Like I would have missed that as well. Exactly, exactly. And also I think because you, these characters are being, and you are being so honest with, you know, um, the readers as far as the faults of all of these characters and, you know, and they're pretty hard on themselves as well. So they're, you know, so we're seeing the characters through that sort of lens of being very critical sometimes, I, which we can be with ourselves. And because of that, you know, and this is one of my favorite things to talk about. So forgive me for this, but because of that, I think we come to a little bit of this, you know, thing of, are some of these people coming off as unlikable? The unlikable, especially the women, right? The unlike, I, I, I cannot stand when people criticize characters in a novel for being unlikable because you're sort of like, yeah, well, if you knew what I was thinking all the time and we knew what you were thinking all the time, then we would all seem pretty unlikable. But talk a little bit about that because you're so courageous about it and you don't shy away from it, which I applaud you for. 
Well, I really appreciate that because I'm completely with you about that. I, I think unlikability or likability is the wrong way to frame mm -hmm. characters in totally. fiction. Totally. I think that the more deeply flawed, the more honest we're being mm -hmm. because we are all deeply flawed. And we exactly. all have, like you said, there. If, if everyone knew all of our thoughts all of the time, well, my goodness, we wouldn't have anyone in our lives, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and these characters are just right out there with the things that they struggle with and the way that they feel. And and the fact that they're, they're, they blame themselves for some of those feelings. Um, and at the same time, they're not always their best self. Um, but again, who is? So I think what we want fiction to do is less provide likable people for readers to engage with and more human people for readers to engage with, more honest, authentic people who are both beautiful and flawed. I, I look at each of my characters, even some of those that a reader might think is the villain of the story. And I would say that there are characteristics of that character that I find deeply appealing and really quite beautiful. Um, yeah. one, one character in particular is very hard to dislike, in my opinion, um, though the choices that he makes are egregious, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. So then um, we also, that also comes to a little bit of um, some of the other things that I was thinking when I was reading, which is, um, even though you're very generous, I think, with all of these characters, there are, there is some social commentary that you throw in with respect to, you know, some of the parenting styles is, is particularly that I was, you know, really drawn to and some of the stage mothers that we see because we are in this environment and things like that. Um, so there is a little bit of, but I don't feel like it's coming from, you know, you, the author, I feel like it's just sort of the natural sort of interaction of the characters and the consequences of some of these flaws that we're seeing where the commentary that I think Lynn Reeves is making is kind of coming out in an organic way, which I really loved as well. Yeah, well, I, I really hope so because I love parents and I think parents are doing their best. Yes. Uh, parenting is enormously challenging. Yeah. Uh, that said, I do examine some of the competitive and high pressure, high stakes parenting yep. that is happening right now. Mm -hmm. And while some readers may not have their children in theater, they'll be able, I actually had one writer, uh, writer reader tell me the other day that uh, she, her children are in the world of athletics and she read it oh. and said, felt exactly the same, whether it's Completely. theater or athletics, right? Completely. Um, or applying to college, right? So, uh, so yes, we've made the idea of molding and shaping mm -hmm. uh, our teenagers into something we see as an outcome, as, as opposed to letting them engage in a process. And so yeah. that comes out, that comes out a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this one particular character who really engages in the most high stakes pressure and competition. You know, even she in the end shows us her delicate side and where things are challenging for her in her life. And so again, I wanted to make her three dimensional. I didn't want to make her one note. No, absolutely. And that's what I meant about your generosity with these characters. I feel like you were, you know, yeah, you know, I think that it's sort of like um, when you are a mother and, you know, you have a little bit of the tough love thing going. I feel like in a way, as an author, one of the ways that we can be, you know, um, the sort of most fair to our characters and to our readers is by applying a little bit of that tough love to sort of show their flaws when they are flawed, just like you would say to a child, you know, hey, honey, I love you, but what you did or what happened wasn't really the best. And let's think of how we can change that going forward. You know, that kind of sort of brutal honesty sometimes, but then at the same time, taking the time and taking care to sort of show the other side. And, you know, and, and, and that's what I think is the generosity that, um, you know, that when you, when a story does that, that's what makes it so satisfying because the end that that's what makes it so easier, so much easier to um, empathize with the characters. 
And that's really the whole experience for me as a writer. I, I love story, but at the end of the day, I want to inhabit the psychology of these characters. Mm. I want to really understand, you know, what makes somebody a stage mother? Why would someone push their child when it's very clear right. he is miserable? That, right. that, that teenage boy in this story is miserable. And yet he follows along with what the path has been laid out for him. And, and I wondered about that, but what toll did that take? And that's yeah. where we get to examine what toll that takes. That's, and, that, and that's really just a subplot. That isn't even the whole- Right, no, no, no. And we, we, it, when we haven't even talked about the, actually the, you know, the addiction um, side of it. And I'm so, I'm, I have to be careful because, you know, with all of these, we have to be careful not to sort of have any spoilers or anything, but I don't think it's a spoiler to say that addiction plays a huge, huge part in, um, in your story. And, you know, and it's something that you have said that you are really concerned about and that you really um, wanted to explore. And that was sort of the one of the main impetus for the main impetus for um, you writing this. So, yeah. So talk a little bit about that and sort of that cycle and how and and the role of the enablers and you know the support but also enabling you know that kind of thing too which is something that we talked a little bit about yeah with with one of the characters in particular yeah so addiction plays a huge role in the story because once the the tragedy occurs where the two girls have been abducted and one girl returns alive and the other one does not it opens up their families for sort of an examination of what, if any, anyone else played a role in it. And one of the things about writing domestic suspense is that I wanted to explore what if everyone's involved in some way, shape or form. I felt that the complexity of the story could be, what if everybody had a part to play? Mm. What, would what would happen then, right? Yeah. And so that's what I try to examine is all the different people that may have played a role and one person in particular is the father that struggled the most and the father that kept so many secrets from his family. Yes. Um, and also then because it's the father and because the mother, um, you know, because they're, they're because I, I found myself a little bit frustrated with her, you know, at times for sort of not pushing a little harder and pushing back a little more. And, and I think that goes to some of this feminine, the feminist themes that you also have, um, you know, with respect to sort of women and mothers in particular, pursuing your own desires, your own interests, um, versus, you know, sacrificing for not only your child, but your husband, your community, all of those things, and also just some of the ways that the girls were responding to that and the way that they were sort of, you know, responding not only to that dynamic in their own families and what they saw and, you know, role modeling and things like that, but what they themselves were actually becoming right. also. Yes, yeah, so what, what I really wanted to get into here was how easily it is, how easy it is to slip into the role of caretaker. And the character of Nell, who we do hear from a great deal, mm -hmm. is the mother of the teenage daughter who's returned. And she has to examine uh, the caretaking role that she slipped into. Just like her husband slipped into addiction, she slipped into the role of caretaker until her own life became unrecognizable. And she says that it was almost amazing to her when she looked back on it, how easily she slipped into it and was completely unaware that she was doing so. Mm -hmm. And I've already heard from readers, especially women who say that they've experienced that same thing in the pandemic, which was that the bulk of the responsibility of caretaking fell to them without them participating in assuming that role. It just happens. Um, and so I really did want to examine that. I wanted to look at, you know, again, when is it okay to think it's time to end a relationship? If someone is struggling with addiction, is it ever fair to leave them? Or is that what you should do to save your, your own, you know, your own emotion, emotional well-being? And exactly. that children. That's right. A, and that's a tricky question to ask. Yeah. And and I think that's why um, 
the review that I read at the very beginning, um, talking about how book clubs will find this, you know, there's so much stuff that you can sort of sink your teeth into. There are so many moral debates that I think people could have about, you know, the decisions that characters made or didn't make and what else they could have done, what else they should have done, you know, is it right? Um, and this addiction, you know, question, because it's so you do want to protect yourself and you want to protect the others that you love. But at the same time, because it is something that you can sympathize with, it is so difficult. There is no sort of, it's, it's like a naturally made dilemma, you know, which I think is also makes for great, you know, fiction too. Um, well, it's, so, also, it's also the cycle of addiction, which is that people get better and then they relapse. So, yes. so if you're in a partnership with someone who you love and they get better, you have hope. And so exactly. you stay. Exactly. And then they relapse and then suddenly you're saying, here we are again. Exactly. So, so it's by its very nature um, luring you into staying. Exactly. Well, Even, and, exactly. Yeah. Because because we want to be hopeful. Yes. Because we want to give them the benefit of the doubt. And we always, you know, want to say, well, next, maybe next time. Right. And um, in, this case, in this case, the character loves her husband. She loves her husband. Of you course. Know? Of course. Absolutely. Um, and then I had one other question. And then we have some questions from the audience that we'll turn hey. to. Um, but you've written as um, Lynn Griffin. Yes. Um, I guess more on the romance uh, side, right? Yeah, or is I, that right? I would no, say not really? fiction. Yeah. So what, what, I'm sorry. So why the? I'm I'm just curious as a as another writer. Um, why the why the two different names and what 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 was what was the thought process here? Because um, I did think that there was I loved the romance that was here and the hope that's you know I, I again I don't want to spoil but it it was kind of delicious and the and the uh, prospect for maybe a series so we'll have to talk about what you're what else you're doing next also good good so I would say that the three novels that came before were squarely general fiction. Okay. Uh, they, they were sort of considered um, book club or upmarket fiction. Uh, my full name is Lynn Reeves Griffin. And so when I went to publish uh, the first three novels, uh, my publisher felt simple is better, go with Lynn Griffin. So mm -hmm. I did do that. And then, but I still go by Lynn Reeves Griffin everywhere I go. Right. Uh, but then when it came to this novel, even though it still comes from my family counseling background mm -hmm. and it still has the same, what I say is, you know, sort of my DNA, uh, it clearly, because of the pace and the tension and the twists and turns, it clearly was dom domestic suspense. And my publisher mm -hmm. wanted to delineate that from my earlier work. So again, mm -hmm. my, my full name is Lynn Reeves Griffin. We just decided that going down this road, we'd use okay. Lynn Reeves. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so we have some questions from the audience that um, I think um, I'm just going to go through. Um, so Henriette um, Lazaridis, I don't know if I'm butchering that name. She um, said she just wanted to say congratulations to you, Lynn. So yay, so nice. Thank you. Um, and Katrin Schumann. Oh, yay. Um, okay, who's a friend of mine? Do you know her as well? I do. From Austin, I do. Right? Yeah. yeah. Who's a friend of mine from debut 18 or 19? I don't know. It's one of those those two <laughs> um, groups. My my book was originally supposed to come out in 2018. So I joined the debut authors 2018 group and then it was moved back to 2019. So then I joined that one. And now I sort of confuse the two groups. But yay, so so good to um, virtually see you. Okay, so she asks, what was the most challenging aspect of writing this novel? It was definitely getting the structure right. So I really wanted to use those plays. And once I was wed to that idea, I really wanted to make it work. I wanted each of the plays to inform what the chapter was about. Mm -hmm. I wanted images from the plays to find their way in. I wanted to use uh, some of the themes of each play to fit the chapter. So once I started to do that, I knew what my story was, but I needed to make sure that structurally it would work. Uh, so that was pretty ambitious. But it was also so, quite joyful to do. 
Oh, so fun. But um, so when did you so so for example, so if you are working, you know that you're working on this upcoming chapter first. Did you know before you wrote the chapter what the play was going to be? Um, or did you write it and then like sort of think, okay, this play might be good and then superimpose those elements on top? Oh no, I think Lynn is frozen. Yeah. Oh. Lynn, Lynn. Oh, no. okay, now you're okay. You're, oh, you're yeah. back. All right. Okay. So answer my question. Did you did you hear all of my questions? I did. Okay. I did. So I would say it was um sometimes I had the idea for what the play was. So for example, there's a chapter in there called a doll's house. And I knew that we were going to bump into Tally's old dollhouse, but that there was going to be a story behind the house. Mm. And I also knew that that was a chapter about marriage and about feeling trapped in a marriage, as is Ibsen's play. Mm. And so I knew that the play was informing the story. And I, don't, I also used it as a jumping off point. But that wasn't true of every chapter. Sometimes I would be a little stuck and I'd have to figure out structurally where I was going to go. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, <laughs> I can't even <laughs> imagine. That seems like such a difficult thing to do. Okay, so Laura Griffin says the heart of the story, the relationships and the exploration of the themes could have been told in many different ways. What drew you to tell the story as a suspense mystery novel versus another genre? That's a great question. Great question. Yeah. So I think that this story told me what it needed to be because I did set out to write it as I had set out to write my other novels, which mm. was focus on psychology of character and focus on a social issue. That's really at the heart of what I do. Okay. It was the story itself. Once I got into all the research around addiction and I knew that there was going to be a high degree of deception a lot of unreliable people in terms of their own storytelling. Mm -hmm. The genre came to me, it came to the story. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't actually set out to write it that way. Do you outline first? I don't. I start off with the psychology and the social issue. Mm -hmm. And it's probably, I'm going to say 50 to 100 pages in, I start plotting. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, Katrin asks another question. Is it possible to have too much sympathy? Where do you draw the line as a human and as a writer? What a great question too. These yeah. are great questions. They really are. I have to say, I have gotten this question a lot, which is because I write about mental health. I often get the question, are people using their mental health as an excuse for mm. behavior? Mm. And I think that that's an interesting question because it's a bit of a pendulum swing. If we're thinking about we don't want to talk about mental health, we want to keep it behind closed doors. As soon as we bring it into the light, we mm -hmm. might be having this feeling that now everybody has a mental health condition in which they want that to be the excuse for their behavior. And that's not right. what I'm saying at all. Right. Well, what I'm saying is we are we struggle with mental health issues and we're still responsible for our behavior, mm -hmm. that there is a consequence to some of our struggles. And in fact, what I'm hoping comes out of this story is that people will talk about mental health and addiction more honestly so that we can have empathy for people and still hold them accountable mm -hmm. for the choices that they make because right. their choices are impacting their family and their friends. Right. And also um, be more understanding toward the family members if they do say, I'm sorry, but I, it, you know, we need to have more boundaries and things like that. So that's right. Okay. And to understand the struggle of the caretakers, to right. understand the struggle of the people that are sort of in the shadow of the addiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Renee Duchenne Farks says, I am a head of school. I think this book could be a fantastic parent read. Many of the issues could, could also be related to parents. Um, so uh, uh, parents of kids in sports, academic student equal to those arts. Yep, absolutely. I have a strong commitment to the value of parents and partnerships with schools. There's a real opportunity to work through this content with parents and help them be the pe best parents, which they all desire. And uh, continued further is that this is a great parent read and discussion to support our parents needs to be the best parent.
Uh oh, I think Lynn and maybe uh, Frozen again. Oh, there she is. Here I am. Oh my goodness. Um, I think it's absolutely true that this would be a good dialogue for parents because I think parents could see themselves in these struggles. Again, a lot of what these women, particularly the two mothers that we showcase in the school, um, they're dealing with their own challenges and they face, you know, a lot, they, they really have their children's best interest in mind, but they're trying to navigate a complicated landscape and parenting today is very complicated. There's no doubt about it. So I would welcome that opportunity. I think it would be great for the Parent Book Club. Oh, that's great. Um, from Katrin, from my daughter, Greta, do you write with a theme in mind? Where do you start your books? Character, setting, theme? I definitely start my characters and my social issue. So I know, for example, that my next novel is going to be focused on the impact of adoption on families mm -hmm. and children who grow up to either want to know their origin story or those that don't. Mm -hmm. And the obligation that parents have for sharing that if that story is traumatic. And so and so again, there I go, I've got my character, I've got my issue, and then I start thinking about plot and I start thinking about how I'm going to showcase that in a way that's gonna engage the reader in that dialogue. Oh, that's great. So um, a writing process follow-up for me, how long did it take you to write this book? And is it, is it different from um, the, the process of writing this? And I guess your next book is also sort of uh more suspense oriented and uh is that do you feel do you feel like those processes are different and about how long of a process is it so this one took between three and four years to write uh, but all of mine have taken a different length of time but my process hasn't changed okay so so it, the story and it's how much research i need to do and how many characters i'm going to use like this this one took me a little bit longer because there were three points of view Mm -hmm. And I had up till that point only worked with two points of view. Mm -hmm. So each of them needed their own backstories and motivations. And so they each take a different amount of time based on what they are. But the process for me is the same. I do all my research ahead of time because then I put the research aside. I really like whatever I've learned to come out authentically and organically. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be sort of plopped in. Um, so I do all my research and then I put all of that aside and then hope that I've internalized it. Right, right. Um, and then that's how I go forward. Oh, that's great. And so the next um, book that you're working on, so I know you talked a little bit about it. Is there more to tell us? And also, might we see some of these characters again? So in the next novel that's coming out next year, it's called mm -hmm. Dark Rivers to Cross. And it's the one that I just described about adoption and families and whether or not we should share the stories of, of our lives if they involve trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also working on something else. So that one's in production and I'm starting another. Um, oh, but, wow. Yeah. So Yeah, because you said three to four years and yet you have another book coming out next year. So I know, but these, <laughs> two, but these two got sold together. So that's okay. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. So, so that's, and then, and then um, my question about, are we going to see some of these characters? Oh, again? yes. So really good question. And I will tell you that I think so, because there are two characters in particular, and I think you know which two, yes. who feel like there's unfinished business. There's some <laughs> backstory pieces that we, we're led to believe may resolve but we're not told explicitly if they do. So they're still talking to me, I think. Oh, good. Well, I'm so <laughs> glad because it just seems like sort of a natural when you have characters that are really dynamic and whose stories I feel like haven't resolved fully. I feel like, you know, it's so wonderful for us as readers to be able to, you know, follow them along and things like that. And also then you have more of, um, you know, possibility for um, interest from Hollywood and, you know, that kind of stuff that makes it so fun for the readers to engage with as well. Yes. Well, and I think those two, those two characters in particular 
the detective and the psych psychiatrist, they really feel like they have so many more um, social issue stories that they could help us to think about. Uh, just be, by the very nature of their work and their and their backstories. Yeah, and also their obvious chemistry together. Nice. Um, you know, when you have something like that, it's such a gift. And I feel like, and also just um, functionally, their jobs go really well together, you know? And um, and I can see this this happening in lots of situations down the, down the line where, you know, that could be really, really fun for us to see how they grow and how their relationship helps to inform whatever new things that they're working on together. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad because I really want to see more of them too. <laughs> I'm good. Well, I'm so glad. Okay. So we have a, like a uh, maybe a few more minutes for some last you know, questions, if we have, we have another comment from Renee, um, the school educator, um, who the head of school, who um, said, um, gives parents a glimpse to the child's life, and they're so wanting to be included. I love, yeah, that's such an interesting thing, too, is that it's not just parenting, um, where you're trying to just guide the children, but also trying to live like through the child as well. And also just to form a more intimate relationship with the children. And when that longing comes out, it's so kind of devastating because I think we all feel that as parents. It's just like one of these universal things, you know? And the, the sort of lead actress in this story uh, really starts to showcase some of the early messages that she's getting from our culture, which is to bury her request for help in a joke or sarcasm, right? To not ask outright for help. Yes. Uh, and, and that gets explored here too, is what, what are, what are the teenagers need from adults? That gets explored a little bit too. Yeah. And I remember when I read that, that was what made me think this is like great commentary for girls also, like on the feminism you know, um, thread of thinking, what are we teaching, you know, girls versus boys and, you know, what's appropriate, um, you know, to be assertive for boys versus like be sensitive and thoughtful and caring for girls. And what does that bring out? And then we see how that gets played out in the older, you know, marriages that we see, the, those kinds of adult relationships that we see. Right, because Nell got those messages when she was a teenager and she falls into the position of being a caretaker who can't use her voice for her own health and well-being. Right. Right. So there, there's definitely, again, packaged in a story that is intended to let readers escape and, and feel uh, like they lose a little bit of time, a real, a real escape, that was my hope. Um, there's really a lot to be thinking about too. So I'm hoping yeah, that no. readers will take that away. Yeah, no, totally. And, um, and the other thing that I wanted to, um, oh my God, I just had this brain thing where I was like looking at the <laughs> clock and I was like, oh, I have to finish my, my yeah. last question. And then I completely forgot what that was. So well, the, well, the, time, the time flew by. I, it really did. Yeah, no, it was really, really fun. And I'm so glad that we got to chat about this. Great, me too. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank you both on the ha behalf of Politics and Froze for doing this event. Thank you, Lynn, uh, for doing having us on your book tour for The Dangers of an Ordinary Night. Um, thank you, Angie, for moderating this event for us, um, taking time out of your schedule as well. Uh, the conversation was great and it was fun and informative as well. Um, those of you watching, we thank you for always tuning in and supporting our events. Uh, we ask that uh, you further support us in the store by purchasing your copy of The Dangers of an Ordinary Night from us. The link for uh, purchasing the book online is in the chat. You can always stop in our three stores and purchase it as well. And our member sale starts 
tomorrow. Um, it starts at midnight for those of you shopping online. <laughs> and it runs through Sunday. If you're a member with Politics and Pros, you get 20% off majority of the store, which includes this book. All right. And I wish everyone a great Thursday night. Thank, Thank you so you. much again. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.